Abba, אנחנו מודים לך עבור הזמן הזה. Father, we thank you for this time to open your word. And uh, thank you, Lord, for helping us to hear from you and express it in Yeshua's name. Amen, amen. I want to uh, start with a quote from Joel, the prophet Joel. Some of these things are a little different in, in Hebrew and English. In this one, in, I think we're in Joel 3, uh, and we're going to read verses 2, 12, and 14. If the verse numbers are different, and then you can help me out with that. But um, it was interesting. We, we, we'd been very busy last night with all different things going on in, in the ministry, and um, the Lord didn't give me the, the message. And, and then this morning I woke up, and it was kind of, I thought, why didn't you give me the message yet? <laughs> and then it was just, boop, he just told me what it was. So I hope I can uh, pass it on in a correct way. Thank you, Lord. And that is just to, um, what I heard him just tell to me was, Hamonim Hamonim Be'emek Harutzi. So let's look, and that's a quote from, from uh, Joel. Multitudes, multitudes in the Valley of Decision. So let's look at the verses on that, and then we'll expand it. You'll see that it's connected with a lot of different things there. Uh, Joel chapter 3, verse 2. In the beginning, it talks about that, just to set it up here, that this takes, during, takes place during the time of Israel's restoration, which is our generation. I wonder how people read this prophecy in all the years, the last 2,000 years, but we're reading it in the generation that it's occurring in. Hallelujah. Verse 2. And he said, uh, He said, I've gathered all of the Gentiles or of the nations, um, and I have brought them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, and um, there I will bring them into judgment concerning my people and the inheritance, my inheritance, Israel. And then he goes on specifically to talk about the land and so on. Verse 12. And said, let the nations awaken and, and come up into the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all of the nations around. Ooh. And then here's the verse, particularly verse 14. Hamonim, hamonim be'emek hecharutz. Ki karov yom Adonai be'emek hecharutz. It says, for multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision, we'll talk about that word in a minute, um, for the day of the Lord is close at hand in the valley of decision. The word there for decision is not the normal word for decision, like achlata, it's, it's chaurutz, like when you, when you, lachrutz uh, mishpat, when you pass a judicial decision, when you make a decision to really to punish someone, you know, so it's really talking about a decision to, to a uh, judicial decision to punish someone. That's really, I would stretch that word out. So he said, I'm going to bring uh, um, multitudes and multitudes of the nations down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and there I will pass judicial judgment on them to give them punishment. Wow. It's a little scary. Um, and let's look at this for, in, a, in a couple different angles. First of all, the idea is that God judges nations. He judges whole people groups. He also judges people as individuals, in which we all need, we've all sinned, and we all die. So we all have to repent of what we did wrong, and we have to find someone that's got a solution to death, which is there's only one person in history, and that's Yeshua. So we repent of our sins and turn to Yeshua so we can have life. And it turns out that he also died for us, so that also gives us atonement. That's the, that's the gospel. Yeshua was crucified and raised from the dead to give us eternal salvation. But God also, is there is also the gospel of the kingdom, which God has a plan for all of the nations of the world. It's not just you by yourself and you by yourself. He has a plan for the world. He, this plan was before he created the universe. He had a plan to create... a. a the world, planet Earth, filled with people as a big family, but also a big society. And, so, and, and the families become grow, and they become nations. 
And so God also brings his judgment to the nations of the world. And logically and morally, the only way he could do that is whoever was the first person that came to faith, in this case, I'm meaning Abraham, he would bring him back to the place where the Garden of Eden was and, and with a place that will be the capital of the kingdom. And out of that will become a people group, will become a nation, uh, not just from his own family, but people that will join to it. And so we will have that the only way it can happen is to judge the other nations of the world, how they react to this nation, which was the nation of the first family of the first believer. It couldn't happen another way. Didn't have to be Abraham. Could have been someone else. But whoever was the first believer, he had to bring him back to this piece of land and grow that family into a nation and then judge the other nations by their reactions to this nation. You got that? So here he's talking about bringing all the nations of the world into judgment according to how they react to the nation of Israel and particularly the land of the nation of Israel and God's inheritance here. Now, so this is, this is huge. We're here at the, we just happen to be filming this right now. It's the beginning of the month of Elul, which is the sixth month of the year coming before the seventh month. You remember the seventh month is the one with all the big holidays, Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Weeks and Eighth Day Assembly, Tabernacles, and, and, uh, and we have all that. And this is the month of preparation. And they say, the rabbi said, the king is in the field. Now, as you're getting ready, the king is about to come. How it really describes our situation right now. With the, like, he's not here, but he can feel it. He's coming. It's getting close. And so our hearts need, need, need to be touched. We also have to feel it right after we had this, this situation here where, where uh, Hamas killed, and as far as we can tell, they shot him in the head, shot him in the head in the underground tunnel. Uh, after they've been holding them hostage for over, for three hundred days, and uh, it's interesting that that's causing a reaction. Was, there's the one thing is that they killed these six people, but much bigger than that is the reaction. What happens? It the reaction. What happens in Israel, and actually the reaction of all the nations, of all the news media, of all of the diplomatic world. It's it's amazing. In other words, God is using the situation right here to start to bring judgment to the nations of the world. He's saying, I'm going to make you choose as nation, as, na- as ethnic groups, what are you going to choose about this nation here? Now, whether the people in this nation are holy or not, are holy has really got nothing to do with it. You know? And we who live here know how holy we are not, and you know? know how righteous we are not, but that's not the issue. The issue was God's sovereignty. He said, I brought this nation here, I put them here, I gave them this land, and now what are you going to to, to do about it. And so uh, we're looking at this situation in which we have uh, a war going on, but almost stronger than the war is the psychological warfare within our people. And then even bigger than that is the calling of the nations of the world that they have to make a decision about it. Wow. And that's what I felt what the Lord was saying, that the, the answer to this multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision is God is using the situation now as maybe never before in history. The nations of the world have to, to make a decision. Um, a couple of things I want to mention. I just wrote uh, uh, an article, we haven't published it yet, and it's called, uh, I, love, I Love Arabs, I Hate Jihad. And I go, to, I talk, go through and talk about the, a little bit of the history of jihad. And one of the psychological tests for our people is, uh, people said, wait, wait, we can't hate Arabs? What are you talking about? That we, we hate jihad. We hate murderers, terrorists. But, that we, but we love Arab people. These are our, this is, this is our extended family. And we all know that here. And, and, and in fact, the, the, the prayer list that we put out last month that went over the whole world, the first poor four points of the, of the, of the prayer list were, were praying for Arabs. The first one was compassion on the people in Gaza. But that was the first point in our prayer list that went out last month. So it's a, we love Arabs. That's a test for our own people that we have to not, we have to focus. Wait a minute. Don't fall into racism that you're against Arabs. That's not what it's about. We're against murder, which is the first moral, the highest moral commandment. Don't murder. And, all this. and so we're against murderers. That's what's going on. We're not against any people group. 
and we're not at anyone. But so we have to deal with that. We're not talking, but that's part of the 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 psychological warfare on our people. Now, what's interesting there is that um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu exposed this document that he said that we seem to have been recovered from from the from one of the tunnels, which means if we recovered it there, our troops must have been very close to getting to them. I mean, if, if they ran out before that happened, if they ran out and they leave weapons and money and documents on the table, that means we were within a couple of minutes of getting there. But now, according to this, we don't know who exactly, some people say Sinwar wrote it, I don't know, but Netanyahu said it's, if it wasn't Sinwar, it was one of the people on his, his close team. And uh, it was interesting that he said on that, uh, it, there was just four points on it, and he, it's interesting, he brought up this area of psychological warfare. There's only four points to it, and, but two of the points spoke of psychological warfare. In Arabic or Hebrew, that would be nafshi or nafsi, which would be actually soulish. What the word psycho in, 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 uh, in uh, foreign languages is soul. So psychologi is the, 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 the soul warfare, the psychological warfare. And he just said, and it's been made famous now already, he said, but the, the way they're, what they're doing is one is to, we are going to uh, uh, kill, kill hostages or show pictures of hostages because we know that psychologically that's going to make the Israeli people turn toward us and turn against the government. And he said, that's what we want to do. And the second thing is that it was to put pressure, use the situation to put pressure on the security minister, uh, Galant. And the third thing is to cause pressure to cause the people to hate the prime minister and to blame him for what Netanyahu. And the last thing was, is that to, it, would, it will destroy the argument that continuing military pressure will help uh, win the war and set the hostages free. Well, it's obvious if those are the four things he said, those are the things that he doesn't want to have happen. So those are the things we have to wake up to. But he was aware of the fact that the warfare here is, is it, certainly it's military, but more than military, it's psychological. Because the, the, and really, the people of Israel, we could win this war pretty easily. If we weren't so psychologically divided among ourselves, then it's not, it's, it's not, it's amazing. And, and that's where the attack is coming. So think about this. Now, I see that as demonic, it's, it's demonic using this situation to come against the minds. Okay, psychologically, it means emotions and, and, and mind, your thoughts, what's going on in the people of Israel and the people all around the world. This is an attack from, from Satan upon the minds and the hearts and the emotions and the psychologies of the people around the world. Now, not to be afraid of that, because God has set this up. God's in, con- God's, God's in control. <laughs> God allows Satan to be here so, to put evil in front of people so that they have to choose between good and bad. Now, in addition to the psychology of our people, is now this is going out because of the media, which never was before. I mean, you think about it, even 10 years ago, there wasn't the type of media that there was today. The media, the diplomacy, the news programs, it's going on all over the world. We've been actually surprised, uh, actually not that surprised, uh, that you're seeing now, even from this recent set of murders, how many of the Arab nations are coming, the people in the, in the, in the Arab news broadcast are for the first time, they come up, oh, this is ridiculous, we're not for it, that's not where we're getting, and they're beginning to choose for that, and the, the moderate most of the Arab nations here around us, the, the Sunni nations, they would really rather have a cooperative relationship, but they're not for, they're not for jihadism. There's a battle within them. Just as there is a battle within psychologically within Israel, there's a battle within all of the Arab nations and all of the Muslim nations. You know, the majority of Muslim nations are not Arab. The Arab nations are the minority of the Muslim nations. And, but in all of the Muslim nations, there is a battle going on. Wait a minute. Is this what we believe in? We believe in jihad and we believe in murder like this, or don't we? But that's a moral test that God is bringing them to. And then for all of the rest of the world, in, in particular in the whole liberal world, looking at this, oh, what is it that you believe in? What is it that you stand against? I mean, if you, if you can't, let's put it this way, if terrorists coming across kidnapping people, and thank God, thank God, Steve, I don't mean it that way, on a moral test reason, I'm saying thank God that it works out that way. At least one of those six people is an American. 
Because if it hadn't have been, the Americans wouldn't have cared about it. But it's something that a terrorist came across, kidnapped an American or six Israelis, put them in an under, under the ground in the darkness for 300 days and then shot them in the head. Well, what's the moral choice here? And it's amazing that a lot of the world is using that to say why Israel is wrong. I, don't, I mean, it's, I don't get that morally, but, uh, but God is saying you need to choose on that. I'm thinking it's about, it reminds me like what Solomon did with, when he said, bring the sword. He's got, you, okay, you've got two harlots here who claim this one baby is theirs. I'll bring the sword. Well, let's kill the baby. Let's see how the people react. And what God is doing in a way is letting these attacks come upon Israel in all these internally, the Muslim world, the international world, the liberal world, the academic world. Let them, let them come. I mean, I think God's been pretty fed up with a lot of what's going on in the academic world for the last 50 years. So he said, okay, yeah, come on. Let's go ahead. I don't mind. Come attack me. I want to bring you into a set of judgment. God is not afraid. God is all powerful. He's not going, whoa, what are, what are these uh, you know, terrorists going to do? It's, it, he's all powerful. He's interested in moral judgment. That's what he wants to do. And he's saying, so I'm going to allow all these people to come and, and judge them. And so what do you so The United Nations. God is going to bring that into judgment. What are you going to do when 99% of the judgments in the United Nations were all coming against Israel the last 20 years? What happened? What happened? What, it, where is your sense of justice? What's going on? And so God is bringing the nations into, into, into judgment because of the situation with Israel. Here's another thought, which we would have to develop another time. But, I, you know, uh, all, most of us know who share the gospel with, with, with our people, with the Jewish people. We all know Isaiah 53, which is a prophecy from Isaiah about that the Messiah has to suffer. The rabbinic interpretation of that is it's not talking about the Messiah, but it's talking about the people of Israel. The people of Israel are suffering a, a two on, in front of the nations to be able to bring the nations to faith to test the nations. I do not think that that is the primary reason, uh, interpretation of the text. The trial of the text is the person, because it says in, in Isaiah 60, uh, the, the sins of my people, the my people, the people of Israel. On the other hand, I do believe it is a secondary uh, parable that's going on, because throughout the book of Isaiah, there's a play on the word my servant. And sometimes the word servant is plural, and sometimes it's singular. So its primary meaning is talking about Yeshua. And his suffering for us. But how is God going to share that with everyone in the world? Of course, it's by preaching the gospel. But he's also allowing a historic event to happen now, which is allowing all of the nations to attack Israel, whether it's militarily, whether it's in academic world, whether it's in the media, whether it's, he's allowing that to happen and say, go ahead. This is the only country, the only nation in the world that has God in the name of the country. Go ahead. What, do you want to attack me? Go ahead. Let's see what you want to do. Come on down. Come on down. He says, you prepare yourselves for war. God is not saying, oh, let's make peace. He's saying, no, no, you want, you want to fight? Put on your best. Get all your weapons. Prepare. Wake up. Come on. Give me your best shot. Because, I, because the purpose here is that God is, wants to judge the nations of the world, right or wrong. Similar to this, what happened with Pharaoh. You remember, Egypt was not, it wasn't just the nation of Egypt. Egypt was the, was the empire of the world. All of the nations were inside of Egypt. And God purposely hardened the heart of Pharaoh to make, to make the sin worse and worse and worse until the people had to decide, you're either going to be for it or, not, or, or against it. Depends how you read the text. There it, it could be that you read the text. Actually, the majority of the people there were saying to Pharaoh, what are you, crazy? Stop it. What are you talking to? I don't know where, how God was, was judging the people and the nation, but, there, but, but he was bringing the nations of the world to judgment because he took the slave people, not because, the pe not because of the people who were the people of Israel afterwards, but it was the slave people who were being oppressed by the, by the evil empire and saying, well, how, how is the rest of the world going to react to how this slave people are being mistreated? And now in, in our time, it's how is the world coming, going to react against global jihadism? You know, have we, did, did we forget ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, huh? Hezbollah, Hamas, the, the Ayatollahs burning Israeli flags and burning American flags and saying death to Israel and death to America for, for since 1979? I mean, did, are people forgetting that? You know, 
uh, uh, so, and so God's saying, well, let's, I want to bring you to judgment. Now, it's interesting. Here in this chapter, he uses the word judgment. He doesn't really say whether it's good or bad here. The word, it's, it's almost even. And he says, I'll bring you into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Hard to say if that's talking about something geographical or not. It could be speaking of the valley of Israel in the, in the northern part of Israel where Armageddon is. That would seem to make sense because it, the way it is, the geography of Israel, it's the only one, it's really the only one big valley in a uh, plain in the middle. It's the only place where you could bring millions of people to stand. That's the place where it would be. So it seems like that's the place of judgment, but it doesn't matter if it's that particular place or not. That's the place of, of Armageddon. But the name Yehoshaphat, let's look at that for a moment. Why do you say bring them to the name of Yehoshaphat? Well, of course, it's remembering one of the good kings, one of the best kings, maybe after David, <laughs> was talking about a righteous king. But as a righteous king, as the son of David, he is a symbol, a parable of Yeshua. Now watch the name, Yehoshaphat. Yeho is the, is the first half of the word Jehovah, Yehovah. Or whether you want to call it Yahweh or Jehovah or Yehovah or, or, or Yud Ke Vav Ke, I mean, whatever it is, that, that that name means, we talk about that before, past, present, and future. I said Yehovah would be present, future, past. But, but it means all the different time dimensions. But that name, Yehoshaphat, the beginning of that, Yeho, is in the name Yeshua. Because I realize Yeshua is, is, is the shortened form of, Yeshua, of Jesus' name. His real name is Jehoshua, Yehoshua, which is the same thing as Jehoshaphat. And one says Yehoshua means God will save, and Yehoshaphat means God, Jehovah will judge. These are the two things. And so, I don't know, kind of a strange thing, but it says when Yeshua comes back in Revelation 19 that I have a name that nobody knows. I think it's pretty obvious from, from the scriptures it's Jehoshaphat. He comes the first time, Yehoshua, he's Jehovah saving, and he comes the second time, Jehovah judging. But can't prove that because he said no one knows. But, um, but, but at least the, the theme is correct. And anyway, he's coming back to judge. And the name of Jehovah, Yahweh, yud ke is in the name of Yeshua. We talked about that. You said, how is it important to know whether you say Yahweh, Yehovah, Jehovah? I said, it's a, good, it's a good question. I think the answer is Yehovah, as I understand the ancient languages. But the, the, uh, it doesn't matter. Because that, is, that name is, is put inside of the name of Yeshua. When you say Yeshua, you are including the name Yahweh, Yehoshua in it. So it's, we're not under pressure of fi- trying to figure out whether to say Yahweh or Yahweh or, 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 or Yoshua, Avan. But what I wanted to say was that this name here, the, sim- the name Jehoshaphat is not primarily referring to that king. It's referring to the image of Yeshua returning as Jehovah judging. As he came the first time, Jehovah saving. Now he's coming back, Jehovah judging. And here it means, here, in this case, making a judicial decision on the nations. Now God's got to judge the nations somehow. How could you do it? And I'm saying that you, well, like <laughs> Solomon brought a baby. If, you, if, if the judgment was on two women, you could do it with one baby. But you have to bring a sword. If you don't bring the attack, then you don't know, you don't know how to judge people's hearts or what they're going to choose for. He forced those two women what to make a choice, and one chose for, for compassion, and one chose for death. And so he has to force the issue to make it happen. Now, what I'm saying logically in the history of mankind, whoever God chose to be the first believer, whoever it was, maybe it was going to be a Brazilian, and maybe it doesn't make any difference, or, or a Japanese, but whoever it was, he had to bring that person back to where the Garden of Eden was, back to this land, and then cause that family to grow and become a, a nation. And then that nation had to be spread around the world and brought back and then give the rest of the nations a chance to say, how are you going to react to that nation? That's the only way you could possibly judge the nation. Think how logical this is, historical, prophetic, and, and, and moral. And it's happening right before our eyes right now. It's amazing. I don't know if, if some of you uh, saw the, the statement by, by Kamala Harris. Now, uh, now, some people said, Tell me, well, you don't know where she's at politically, but I'm, I don't care about that. I don't care about that. She is the candidate of the Democratic Party. She could be the most influential liberal politician in the world today. And she made a statement saying Hamas is not a terrorist, not just a terrorist organization. It is an evil terrorist organization. And, they, and, and that the Palestinian people have been suffering 
for 20 years because of the oppression of, of Hamas, and we have to get rid of Hamas for the sake of the Palestinian people. I said, wow, I mean, I mean, did she have me write that for her? I don't know. I mean, it was like it was, it was perfect, you know? You could say she doesn't really believe it. She does believe it. I don't know. I'm praying for her. I'm praying for her heart and for the Democratic Party and for all my liberal American family, Jewish family. There's the, I'm, I'm praying for the whole Western world to do this. I'm going to pray. That's the statement. Don't get caught up in politics. We're not talking about that. We're talking about what's the right position here. What's the truth coming out? And she said the right thing. That's amazing. So, so this is the truth that's going out in the world today. And the world is having to think. The world is having to decide where they stand as a people group. It's amazing. This is happening in South Africa, isn't it? It's happening in Australia. It's happening in all the European nations. Of it. Obviously happening in the United States. But it's happening in really every nation of the world. It's happening secretly inside. It. For instance, in, in, in the United Arab Republic, in the UAE, Emirates, they've really already decided the other way. They really just, they want to be with Israel. The people there are really, they've made the decision this way. And, and, and it looks like that's happening with a lot of the, as I said, the Sunni, the Sunni uh, Arabic nations. But we'll see what happens. God is bringing the nations to, to judge that. And the people that will be leading that in every nation in the world are the born-again, spirit-filled, Bible-believing uh, Christians in that, who, spiritually speaking, have become spiritually part of Israel. They've become part of this nation. Every Christian around the world is, is a resident, is a citizen of their own nation, but spiritually they're part of the nation of Israel. And that's why, and that's why the jihad wants to kill them too. Sure, they want to kill Israel first, but the, but the, the same evil spirit that's out to kill Israel is also out to kill every true Christian around the world. From, you, from their point of view, you're part of Israel. You know? Just like Messianic Jews, it's not, they'd have said, to, we're, we're Israel or Christians. It doesn't make any difference what we say. It's that the evil is out to get us. So the Christians around the world are being drawn into that. And there's a crisis now, not just for every nation. Delicate to say this. There's a crisis going on right now in every church in the world. I'm not talking about unbelieving churches. I'm, talk I'm talking about real believing churches. All of them. They're having to make a decision. Am I going to not only believe in Jesus, but am I also going to stand with this national test? And what's going to happen around the world, it's already happening in a lot of nations, is say, well, you can believe in Jesus, that's fine. But don't say anything about Israel. If you say anything about Israel, we'll throw you in jail. They're going to have to choose. Think about that. What's gonna, is that going to be a split in the Christian community around the world as we come in the end times? There's going to be those who choose not to believe at all. There's going to be those who believe to choose, believe in Yeshua and God's plan for the nations. And those are going to believe in, believe in Yeshua, but, but, you know, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get persecuted. What's going to happen? God's bringing the people into judgment. Now, let's just review a little bit more this word hamon, which is multitudes, and then, and then we'll stop, and then we'll pray. Um, actually, the word hamon first comes up in a positive way. God's plan is always positive. Where does it come up? Abraham. Remember that God changed his name from Abram to Abraham? The ha part is Hamon. It's this word here. He said, I have made you to be the father of a multitude of nations. Av la Hamon Goyim. I have made you to be the father of multitudes of Gentiles. That was Abraham's life story. <laughs> to, to do that, to embrace that role, to be an image of God the Father loving all of the nations of the world. It was a process that took him a hundred years to agree to it and to embrace it. And God says, and now this comes back to God's original plan. God's original plan, both in, you see it in, in Adam and in Noah, and then afterwards in Abraham, is that God wants, he starts with the person, says, be fruitful and multiply, spread around the earth. And I will make borders for your nations. If you go out, if you spread around the earth and you begin to multiply, that person becomes a family. And if the family keeps multiplying, it becomes a nation. So God knew ahead of time that eventually this earth would be covered with different national groups, which are extended family groups, which come out of the one big human family of God that he wants together. But God doesn't want it all just to be one ethnic group. He likes ethnic diversity. So we put borders around the whole world that would all be a multitude of families 
and Abraham as an image of God and as the first covenantal believer to be the father in love of all the nations of the world, of Hamon, of multitude of nations. That's the good plan. That's what we all have in our hearts. But then he said, wait a minute, but the nations are going to have to choose. So he said, let's bring these nations down. After we get them all spread out a bit, let's bring them down to the valley of, of, of judgment. Now, in by the language of Jehoshaphat here in Joel, he judges. You judge, you, you bless the righteous, you reward the righteous and punish the wicked. But you find that in other two major prophecies. One is in the prophecy in Isaiah 29. We won't go there today, but you know that. This is what's called the Ariel prophecy. And here it is. The nations come, and it's the same thing. They're just as multitudes of multitudes come to attack Ariel, which is being a, a, a name, spiritual name for the city of Jerusalem. They come to attack, and God doesn't know. He says, like, their people is, like, having a dream where they're eating, just about to eat something, and they wake up, and the food's gone. So he says, so I'm going to allow all the nations to be in a delusion that they're all going to come back and eat Israel. They're going to eat Jerusalem. They're going to kill us and destroy it. And then they're going to wake up and not have it. And I will come to destroy them. To do that. And then you find it another time in the story of, of Gog and Magog. He says, I will bring multitudes of multitudes. And then you remember, if you, those of you who know the scriptures well, do you know where he's going to bring them? To a place called Hamon Gog. Hamon Gog. It's one word, it's usually translated as one, but actually in Hebrew it's two words, Hamon Gog. The multitudes of the nations that side with Gog against Israel. And then God says, I will destroy them. At the same time that I pour out my spirit all nations, I will destroy the nations. So you have the, the multitudes, first of all, as a multitude of nations, the family of Abraham. And then those multitudes need to be judged in the valley of Jeho, Shaphat, like they are Jeho, Shua, how oh, you come to that? And then they can be judged on uh, how they react to this one country that have the name of God in it, either to be de destroyed and those who come against Jerusalem, because then he's saying, look, the attack is necessarily coming up against Jerusalem, because if you have a kingdom, you have to have a king. And if you have a king with a kingdom, you have to have a capital city. It could have been somewhere else. It could have been Beijing. It could have been Washington, D.C. It could have been Rome. It could have been Paris. It could have been Johannesburg. It doesn't make it, but it's, it could have been Rio de Janeiro. But God chose this city. And the, the people fighting against this, it's not an issue. This is an apocalyptic religious war. If you don't think so, ask Hamas. They'll tell you that's what it is. Stop not believing what they say. Hamas and Hezbollah and Hayatol, they're all saying the same thing. This is about them bringing another person to be the Messiah, the Magdi, and to have him come and destroy Israel and take this over. And, and, and that's what it's all about. So what we're saying is we have a military war. In addition to that, we have a psychological war. And then we have this, the nations, the multitude of nations being brought into uh, judgment. And I think, of course, you change, the, you change the language, but I think one last point, and that is that in Revelation, I think it's saying the same thing. Of course, it's not Hebrew, the different language, but the, the word in, 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 in Greek there is is uklus, where we get the word in Hebrew, uklusin, means population, multitudes. And there it says Yeshua comes back to judge the multitudes, which will either be fighting or praising. So it says, he really, it's just updated into the book of Revelation, the same thing. So that's it. But folks, what, a, what an amazing period we live in. And this God bringing the nations to judge, don't forget, half of it's good, half of it's bad. You know, the numbers of people, I mean, which one is it for the people to decide? But this is a good, it's scary, the fear of God. I'm not saying it's not the fear of God, it's not scary. It's a good thing. God's not interested in avoiding this issue. He's pushing this issue forward. He's pushing in every nation, in every university in the world. He's making them deal with you, their, their, their interpretation of history in every news media, in every social media, in every single nation. This God, God is forcing this issue because he's saying, look, I'm put Yeshua in front of you. Every individual, you need, to dis you need to decide. Nations, I've got my kingdom coming. I had to choose a nation. Whatever nation I chose that, the rest of you would be angry at it. But I have to make a decision. 
God has his, per, his chosen person, which is Yeshua. He's got a chosen nation, which is this nation here. He's got a chosen city, which is the city of Jerusalem. And we have to, everyone has to choose. That's it. Let me pray, and then we'll open up the questions. Father, we thank you in the name of, as I felt you just spoke to my heart, that this war is really, and a bigger issue, is about multitudes in the valley of decision. Hamonim ve'emek echarutz. Thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Yeshua, that you are both Yehoshua and you also Yehoshaphat, that you are Jehovah who saves and Jehovah who judges. Lord, we pray that you would give us an urgency to spread the word to every person and to every nation. We've all, every single one of us, us first, we've all sinned. We all need to repent. We all need to re- submit to the king of the kingdom to come. But as submitting to him, we need to submit to wherever he chooses to put his kingdom, to put his capital, to start with his nation. Lord, and we pray for individuals and nations as a whole to hear this message of the kingdom of God and God coming to judge the nations of the world on how they will react to this situation that we are in right now. Whoa, do we need to pray. Whoa, do we need to repent. Whoa, do we need to have fear of God. Whoa, do we need to speak with grace about truth and justice and righteousness. God, we're asking you for the Holy Spirit to purify us, but also to empower us, Lord, to stand in truth and not to be afraid about all this warfare, to hold on to our sanity, to hold on to our souls and stay faithful to the end, declaring the truth of Yeshua and his kingdom for every person, every nation in his name. Amen.